Welcome to the Law Firm Growth Podcast, where we share the latest tips, tactics, and strategies for scaling your practice from the top experts in the world of growing law firms. Are you ready to take your practice to the next level? Let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Law Firm Growth Podcast. I'm your host, Jan Roos, and uh, I'm here with a solo pod just because it's something that we've been seeing a lot on the client side recently. And I think there is a pretty quick reframe that could set you up for some real success in your practice, no matter you know what you're doing as far as a marketing or a uh, practice area perspective. So I uh, wanted to take an example of something that uh, you're probably familiar with, which is the frame of negotiations. So basically, if you talk to, and I'm sure you've taken a negotiation class at some point in your legal career, um, the best negotiators in the world will be really, really upset if they get to the point where they're making their final offer and it gets accepted right away. And you probably know why, because if somebody says yes right away, that means that you could have asked for more. So it's kind of an interesting situation because we never really know. If we get no feedback, we have no idea how much more was left on the table. We just know that we lost something. So it's really, uh, you know, I'd categorize it as a benefit that's unknown. Who knows how big this benefit is? Now, on the flip side, there is a very tangible negative benefit or (laughs) a very tangible negative outcome to what happens when you ask for too much. And that negative outcome is you get an objection, which is that's too high or, you know, worst case scenario, you know, this is crazy. Um, you know, and in very, very, very bad scenarios, it actually loses the negotiation or it's insulting, but that's that's pretty uh, pretty rare, all things considered. So basically we have a an unknown benefit of the situation and a tangible loss. And the thing that's really, really weird about this is that it's completely against the normal wiring of how people's brains work. So, you know, this isn't anything new probably, but people are, you know, your brain is hardwired to seek pleasure and to avoid pain. So in terms of avoiding pain, it's the more tangible thing here. Um, You know, the pleasure that you'd get out of a negotiation, hopefully one one that's well executed is down the line when the thing ends up paying off, then you're going to have more money. But that's not immediately apparent to your brain. So what we're really oriented to do in practice is to avoid, sorry, um, yes, to avoid the pain. So basically, what most people in practice are looking to do is avoid getting that objection, avoid getting that no, and as a consequence, a lot of money is being left on the table. So um, just want to kind of think about that frame. This is something you know, you're probably familiar with, but there's two very uh, different, very specific applications to growing a law firm that uh, I think are really interesting ways to look at it. So the first thing and definitely the most obvious is raising your rates if you're something outside of a contingency-based fee uh, practice area. But the less obvious one is in follow-up, and that's something that every single practice area can look at. So uh, one of the quotes from the greats, uh, Dan Kennedy, uh, goes something along the lines of, you know, if you haven't pissed somebody off by lunch, then you aren't marketing hard enough. Again, um, in most instances for law firms, it has to do with follow-up. So let's kind of take it back to that negotiation frame and look at what's really happening here. So uh, there's all different kinds of ways you can do follow up. And this can range from, you know, hey, you know, I mean, really, it's asking about how much are you going to be uh, pushing the offer onto the person versus how much are they going to be coming to you? So the more softball ways to approach follow up would be leaving a voicemail, um, letting up to them, you know, doing your, you know, giving them your price and letting them get back to you, giving them all the time in the world to get back. The hardball ways uh, to have somebody do follow up would be, you know, calling them, making sure you're getting them on the phone, you know, uh, sending frequent follow ups, that kind of thing. And basically, if you think about it, you know, the situation where you don't get a piece of feedback is when you could have followed up more. And somebody that you follow up more on is somebody, you know, much like negotiation, it's money that's left on the table. So the cool thing that is kind of about this is that, you know, there's also, there's obviously degrees of doing this. It's not like, you know, in a negotiation, you can raise your price by $500,000 or whatever happens to be in negotiation um, in incremental steps until you get to see where the breaking point is. But that actually is the reality with follow-up. And again, it's just one more call. It's just one more text. It's just one more email. It's just one more voicemail. And basically there's a point at which somebody says, hey, that's too much. 
And then if you aren't hearing that, then that means there's people that you could have signed that you didn't. <laughs> so, um, you know, just kind of bring it back to the legal world. Um, there's actually a really interesting uh, thing I heard from an interview with uh, the director of marketing for Morgan and Morgan, the, you know, basically nationwide personal injury firm. And they got really huge. And I'm sure this is no small part because they are very obsessed with follow up. <laughs> so I heard that whenever they end up getting a lead, regardless of whether it's at, you know, um, 10 in the morning or 12:59 at night, they're going to make sure that that person gets called three times before the end of the day. And again, this is just a, a discipline that they keep that I'm sure is positively correlated with the amount of people that they sign and thus you know, the amount of money that they're building and, and able to, you know, use to expand. So basically, um, you know, there's obviously a, uh, a ridiculous level you can take this to, you know, the, the kind of gut reaction is, well, Hey, you know, I don't want to sacrifice the reputation of my firm. But in practice, uh, you know, as far as what really ticks consumers off, it's being followed up with after you hear no. Think about stuff in your own, you know, in your own personal life. If you told somebody no and they keep pushing, yeah, okay, that's that's a little brash. Um, but in uh, in experience, I think I feel uh, most of the firms that we work with, at least, they're avoiding the first no, and the first no is really where all the value is because that's you know, it's it's almost a free lunch as far as an indicator that's not really going to damage your reputation. If you, somebody says no and you don't follow up, you know, chances are they're not going to uh, write you a nasty Google review. But basically, you know, that's uh, people avoid the single no, but the actual, you know, drawbacks are on the multiple no's. Okay. Second thing, raising your rates. So again, let's, let's think of the negotiation. This maps on a lot more directly onto the experience of uh, closing a client. So, Let's assume that you set everything up correctly. You know, you're you're getting the person into your office or onto the Zoom call before you have the opportunity to present them with your pricing. You know, there's there's some reason to move forward and that's gonna try to get them to make the decision now. And it's just basically time to tell them how much this damn thing is gonna cost, right? So <clears throat> the hardball offer would be something high, right? And again, it's it's whatever you're comfortable with. Um, but the softball offer, and you, you know, you probably have a good feel for what a client will accept given whatever the services you have and offer are. And the softball offer would be something lower. So the thing is, you can, you know, think about, you know, a year of consultations with clients. If you had an entire year where you didn't say no, you know, guess what? You left money on the table, right? If you had a year where you're offering something high, then you, you, you heard no, but chances are you also heard yes a bunch of times. And the thing that's really interesting about raising prices is that once you start accepting higher prices, it's very hard to go down. So, you know, if you're used to doing a trust and estate plan, for example, and you know, you're used to charging 1500 for it. If you take a client that is going to pay you 2,500 for it, then, you know, you're not really going to get super excited for that $1,500 client. If that ends up being the next thing that you charge. Which is basically kind of a positive feedback loop if you think about it. Like, you know, chances are if, if you're getting to the point where you're raising your rates, you have some good experience. But also, if you think about it, it's the same amount of work, but, you know, you've just added 2000 on 1500 That's about, you know, 66% extra that, again, it's not taking money from the client because you're providing a value. It's money that you're going to have into your business, which is going to be profit. That's margin. That's, uh, you know, that's salaries for your staff. That's, you know... Holiday parties you can have to keep morale high. That's budget you can have to market and serve more customers. So it's very good. And I, you know, I'm not trying to, to get into some Gordon Gecko speech here, but <laughs> you should feel you know that you, you're able to charge prices for stuff. And here's the thing too, um, you know, this is this is a piece of advice that was given to me uh, by a coach a couple of years ago. But basically, there are um, you know the amount of prices that people charge have more to do with generally, and this is in any service business. Uh, the prices that people charge have more to do with their level of self-confidence than the actual services that provide. And I just want to, you know, if you can think in your market, I guarantee if you think hard enough or, you know, there's, there's somebody with a lot more experience in you that probably charges less than you. And there's probably somebody with less experience as you that charges more than you. And again, for the reasons that I was kind of outlining earlier, you know, it's really good to have profit into your business. And, you know, this is, this is one of those things where it's literally just you know, the only thing that's stopping you from having a higher uh, retainer is asking for it. Right. And again, so, you know, if you got to the situation where you're, you're not hearing that often, guess what you got to do, right? If you haven't heard that price is too high, then that's something you have to ask. And then also in practice, um, if you're doing this correctly, you know, this is, this is kind of the, um, you know, the false fear that I hear in this. And that is that, you know, you're going to lose clients by having the price be too high. 
So the thing is that as long as you're structuring your clothes in a proper way, you should have a reason to, you know, again, this isn't something like you're going to post on your website or you're going to have, you know, your front desk uh, intake person mention after a three minute phone call, but that's not best practices anyways. So best practices, if you have somebody qualified, you've gotten them into a consultation or some sort of a, a situation. Again, <laughs> the old school, oldest, best way to do this is to get them into your office. Uh, you know, again, as the country opens up, that's going to be a little bit easier to do, but you know, no one's going to, you know, bolt for the window. If the price is too high, what they'll probably say is the price is too high. Is there anything we can do to work with that? Right. People don't generally lose clients because of price. The only, the worst case scenario for asking for a higher price more often than not, is the best case scenario of not asking for a higher price. You just negotiate yourself down to the position you would have asked for. So basically, and then again, think about the sort of, you know, think about a year of, of not hearing that versus a year of hearing that every week, right? Um, so that's basically it for the week. So basically, if you're interested in growing your law firm, you know, taking the mindset of negotiations, walking towards the pain, because the pain is what's going to help you, not what your brain tells you, <laughs> will give you two separate things. If you increase your follow-up, until you hear, stop calling me. <laughs> that's going to be more revenue as in more cases into your firm. And if you're hearing that's too expensive, that's going to be higher margin because you're going to be stepping up your rates. So basically, uh, you know, if this uh, resonated with you at all, my uh, ask for you is to see if you can get somebody to tell you no this week. And uh, if you make this a habit, you know, I'm sure your, uh, your business checking account will thank you over time. All right, that's it for me. And we'll be back with another episode of the Law Firm Growth Podcast next week. Thank you for listening to the Law Firm Growth Podcast. For show notes, free resources, and more, head on over to casefuel.com slash podcast. Looking forward to catching up on the next episode.